Good afternoon, listeners. You're listening to Lament of Hope blog and podcast. Um, I'm really, you know, blessed today as, you know, I've been, I've had so many interviews over the past several months, and it's been so fascinating to learn about so many different topics and people. And one of the topics that I am very passionate about since high school really was learning about the Armenian genocide. Um, I had to do a thesis for it for my senior year. And it was something I had never heard of. And then when I immersed myself in um, primary sources, as well as talking to several different historians, um, doing my own reading as well, it was just incredible to know about this event that took place during World War I um, and wiped out you know, over a million Armenians. Um, and so I have today Dr. Uh, Ruben Adalian, He's the director of the Armenian National Institute in Washington, D.C. Um, so for those who are in Virginia, he's actually, you know, relatively local. Um, but I asked him here today because I just want to be able to discuss the Armenian genocide as well as how that kind of ties into what's going on to the Armenian population even now today. Um, Dr. Dowling, just to kind of start out, you know, what gave you a heart for this topic? Because... One, it is a it's a hard topic, and it's something you're immersing yourself in often, um, because it's your life calling to advocate and to tell about this and to research it. Um, you know, what gave you a heart to do that and kind of make it your life your life passion? Well, it's good to start with the uh, hard question, and the uh, and the challenging one. Um, mm -hmm. Perhaps uh, two reasons. Um, as a youngster, uh, growing up in uh, California, where there's a substantial Armenian community, yeah. uh, probably the largest concentration uh, in the United States, and uh, and on into to college, we became very aware that uh, the generation of survivors was not going to be around for very long. The Armenian genocide had happened in 1915, lasted until 1923. Uh, by the uh, late 20th century, most of the survivors had passed on. So we became very conscious, those of us who were in, in, in school and studying, and my interest was in history to begin with, uh, that uh, here were a group of people who had been witness to a uh, dramatic moment and a dramatic experience uh, in, in the historical sense, not just in the personal sense, and um, that uh, their tes testimony was invaluable. Uh, and so I became very involved in uh, trying to capture uh, their uh, story. And so I interviewed and recorded uh, for various organizations uh, and my own benefit, uh, the stories of the survivors. And these were very, very, very dramatic. And, and uh, of course, the survivors themselves already in their 70s, 80s, some 90s, were themselves quite aware uh, that they held, uh, you know, they held or had possession of a, of a story that should be shared. And so those discussions and interviews would go on for hours. So uh, they weren't uh, like a, uh, a radio or television interview uh, yeah. that's got a stopwatch on it. And uh, some of them, a number of them, were remarkable narrators who could go on for hours with one remarkable story of survival after another, after another. Uh, the cumulative knowledge that uh, I acquired from uh, uh, becoming acquainted with the survivors and the depth of their story was to appreciate the enormous scale of what an event called genocide entails, that it is so encompassing uh, that it uh, reaches out and finds everybody labeled uh, as a target in the policy of identifying them, deporting them, murdering them, whatever the 
final uh, objective of the uh, to total policy is that it that it that it involves a massive uh, coverage of geography, a massive yeah. coverage of the uh, rungs of society, uh, the entire spectrum of uh, human reactions, um, and uh, in the case of the individuals that I ended up interviewing would have also all have been children at the time uh, hmm. of the genocide. Yeah. The adults uh, had long ago passed away. So there was a, a uh, unusual um, aspect to their recollections as well, hmm. because uh, they could speak in ways um, perhaps that an adult would be more restrained in, in sharing. Uh, and that as children, uh, as child survivors, uh, they had retained certain kinds of memories hmm. uh, that, that gave uh, special value to uh, the stories that they were telling the survivors, the ordeals, uh, the uh, the passage of their uh, lives from nor normality uh, to uh, the maelstrom of deportation and starvation and uh, instances of kidnapping, witnessing mass slaughter, um, concentration camps. Uh, it's it, the the drama was it was just endless. Yeah. Um, that in turn, as I trained to be a professional historian, led me to uh, uh, explore another facet of the evidence on the Armenian genocide, and I've spent the greater part of my life now in trying to uncover it because. Uh, a good amount of the documentary evidence on the Armenian genocide is actually in American archives. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the more interesting uh, and unusual aspects of uh, this particular instance in that you know, I try to explain, you know, people who are undergoing, experiencing a genocide are not in a position to record their experiences at the time it's happening. Sure. But other witnesses, observers, could do so. And it just so happened that while the rest of the world was at war, we're talking World War I, a war broken out all over Europe, actually spreads out uh, to the Middle East, uh, right into uh, Africa as well, strangely. Uh, but the United States... Uh, as a great nation, as a great power, actually remained neutral until 1917, so from 1914, August 1914, into the middle of 1917. And there was a, a substantial American presence in Ottoman Turkey at the time. Uh, businessmen, educators, medical uh, professionals. And so they became witness uh, to what was transpiring, and of course, as Americans uh, immersed in an understanding of what human rights is, uh, were simply astonished at this turn of events uh, and uh, the uh, emergence of this policy, which they very soon began to realize was was really invo involved uh, the mass scale elimination of the, of the population. Among those writing back, and as I said, I've been particularly interested in the medical professionals because they're men trained, men and women, there were many nurses, uh, trained in uh, um, attending to the ailments of, of human beings and curing them. Um, they were particularly uh, affected because what they witnessed was far beyond their capacity to address as they saw men and women begin to starve and uh, children uh, obviously as well and uh, all the uh, effects of malnutrition, dehydration and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so they sent back really uh, telling accounts. At the same time, since as I said, the United States was remained neutral, its diplomatic representatives were also present in Ottoman Turkey uh, from 
embassy, fully staffed embassy, to consulates. And the consulates happen to also be located in key cities, uh, major commercial centers. And these centers, of course, had large Armenian populations. So they didn't have to go out of their way to see what was happening to the Armenian population as they were being deported. They could stare out their window. And uh, often uh, these uh, deportee convoys march right and right by their doors. Yeah. Um, and, and so they saw, in some instances, surreptitiously photographed, amazingly enough. And uh, to top it all, the convoys were directed from Armenia, Anatolia, and towards the Syrian desert, which was their final destination. And anybody that happened to have had the strength to survive the deportation uh, arrived to the realization that they weren't going to be resettled anywhere, that this was the end of the road for them. Yeah. But those convoys were routed through one particular city, uh, Aleppo in northern Syria. And there happened to be a very energetic American consul there uh, by the name of Jesse Jackson. And he just virtually on a daily basis went out to witness what in the world was going on here, where these people were coming from, counted them and reported them and created, along with many other consuls and other witnesses, a drama dramatic record. And of course, diplomatic communication is unlike a personal letter and so it has this these formalities about it uh, lacking uh, the, the emotion that becomes invested in uh, communicating about atrocities. And so they are invaluable records as well. And, and so the story of the Armenian genocide ends up in the uh, holdings of United States archives, official archives or, or government's holdings, as well as many other uh, holdings across this country where the witnesses uh, deposited their personal uh, uh, papers and, and, and letters. And these continue to be uncovered here. We are now more than 100 years later, still uh, retrieving uh, you know, an okay. incredible amount of uh, evidence, all of it uh, quite um, unusual in their, in their content, and all of it uh, in the language of uh, that we speak in, all of it in English, which makes it thoroughly accessible. So this was, all of this was so compelling for you that you decided this is what you wanted to pursue. Well, it you know, just to give you a, a sense of how much of a record there is, but I, now I forget how many years I spent plowing through the National Archives. Uh, but the end of it, uh, I had assembled 37,000 pages of evidence. Uh, these were put, put together uh, back in the back in the 90s. Uh, and that was the uh, sum total where I finally stopped because I probably could have gone on for another three, four or five years and uncovered just as much evidence in other parts of the of the uh, uh, of the US archives of uh, uh, and uh, other places as well. So uh, uh, that gives you a sense of how much there was uh, to to look at, to gather, uh, and, and, and to collect. And all of that, of course, paints a very, very vast canvas of what occurred uh, to the Armenian people in Ottoman Turkey. Yeah. Well, you know, Dr. Dalian, I was going to ask, it's... For you, because I know, you know, the survivors accounts that I would read, which I'm sure is not nearly as vast as what you've read, um, it was really hard to keep reading because um, it was really sad. It was really um, some of the things that the accounts would portray were very vivid and I had never heard of it happening to anyone before. Um just acts of violence that were, you know, crazily, uh, like you wouldn't think of it, you know what I'm saying, kind of thing. Um, and so for you, you know, how do you, like over time, has it become easier to read 
all of these histories that it doesn't, you know, emotionally affect you to the point where, you know, it's, it's hard for you? Or is that still something that you work through as a historian as you're just diving into the subject time and time again? You, you put it very, very nicely in that, you know, anybody studying the subject matter is compelled to read uh, of untold cruelties, unimaginable uh, cruelties. Yeah. But uh, one needs to also uh, keep in mind that if a survivor is willing to recount those memories, which is to say to recount a living, lived experience, or uh, sits down and, and, and writes it, they're the ones who have really carried the greater burden and already committed in sharing this narrative. And so and you're quite right that it actually never gets easy. Uh, certainly under no circumstances is it ever uh, an enjoyable work, uh, which leaves me envying art historians and others who can look at nice artwork. Um, nevertheless, there is in some ways this uh, awful uh, image of humankind that is painted or depicted by these records. And it's a reminder that as well as we might want to think about humankind and all the remarkable achievements that men and women have uh, succeeded in accomplishing, there is this other facet that the, there are episodes and regrettably way too many where human behavior takes on a mode that is so barbaric, so out of the norm, uh, so inconsistent with what we live and how we live uh, on a daily basis mm. uh, that it uh, creates a, an entire di different dimension of what man is about or what man can be and should not be. Well, you know, I, I want to ask you, because when I, you know, when we discuss the Armenian genocide, obviously the Turks are, you know, I mean, they're considered the perpetrators of the Armenian genocide. And um, there's this, I don't want to say hatred because it's, you know, it's surprising how many of the survivors, some in their videos, you know, are very vehemently angry and hateful about what happened, understandably. But then you'll have other survivors like Aurora Mardaganian, forgive me if I mess up her last name, um, who said that, you know, she would want the Turks to actually go through a justice system, what she didn't get to do. Um, for you personally, since you're also attached to this by heritage, do you, um, how do you, when you're talking about the evil of humanity and what man is capable of, it's interesting you put it that way because many people I've discussed it would just right away talk about Turks, not necessarily humanity as a whole, the capability that man has to be evil. Um, like for you, is this, do you see the Turks and their history, their heritage as something that it's very difficult for you to value based on what has happened? Um, or for you is the genocide, yes, it was the particular Turks, but it's been different types of you know, countries, different types of um, cultures throughout history. And so you see it more in that scale. How do you view it? Well, we need, we need to clarify uh, and, and, and define uh, the elements that uh, help us understand how a genocide unfolds. And it's become pretty clear through all the research uh, and the examples that have occurred, as I say, unfortunately repeated, that it's not right to speak in terms of an entire people and, and to say the Turks as such. Uh, the decisions were made by a handful of individuals who were running the Turkish Ottoman government. 
and who uh, compelled uh, the administrative apparatus of the state of which they had taken control to commit the atrocities. There were many individuals who did not agree with the policy and uh, attempted, as I say, on an individual basis to make a difference, to yeah. save lives, to rescue children, uh, to do other things uh, that made a, made a difference in the life of some individuals. However, the state uh, typically likes to devise policies that invest the population in supporting a uh, uh, a crime of these dimensions. And in the case of the Young Turk government, this very radical regime that was running the Ottoman state in its final years, uh, the inducement uh, the, uh, to securing economic benefits uh, from the disappearance of a population of nearly 2 million people and the abandonment of all of their possessions, uh, then created an environment where uh, it became feasible to wish to ignore what exactly was being done to the Armenian people. And that uh, regrettably has embedded itself into the uh, historical appreciation of the Turkish people uh, of themselves. And so imagining that while uh, not responsible, nevertheless having benefited, and so uh, being uh, persuaded that it is preferable to deny and not to admit, uh, to uh, ignore and not to confront uh, the uh, this particular piece of uh, history. Um, and as a state uh, that was never held accountable, then it's become easier for the Turkish uh, nation to uh, deny the Armenian genocide. And that's been, I think, in the long-term uh, problem in that the rest of the world is aware of what happened to the Armenian people. And the campaign many decades long now that the Armenians have waged in their now new respective countries and homes for recognition is not so much because the event occurred, but rather because the event is so fiercely denied. Uh, and with that denial comes an effort to erase. And so the acknowledgement and the recognition efforts are part of the uh, undertaking to preserve this history and to draw the proper lessons uh, from them. And so, while not so simple as saying the Turks as a generality, as an entire people, uh, but uh, the Turkish people uh, in, in terms of what they should do, ought to do, and certainly their leadership in terms of how to rethink and reconsider uh, the subject. Is that personally for you, do you hold any bitter feelings toward the Turks or the Turkish government? I, I wouldn't say so. I think even the survivors seem to have come to a, a uh, realization that uh, it's infeasible uh, to both emotionally and intellectually to inhabit that world of anarchy and evil that was created during the course yeah. of the genocide, that to go on, one needs to step away uh, from that, from those events, but rather to honor its memory, to remember the people who fell victim, to hold the uh, responsible parties accountable. Well, those are the methods for, uh, and as a historian, to continue to research and write and communicate and explain and try to understand. Um, those are the methods of, I think, addressing uh, the issue, as well as to join others who are facing the sim similar threats or an imminent situation where uh, 
we can see that there's an unfolding process of increased tension and persecution and endangered populations than to be part of the uh, international effort uh, to continue to speak up against those, to prevent those if possible. I know that the, you know, when I was reading Aurora Mariganian's, uh story, basically she said it and a journalist was writing it up for her. And it was her story of her uh, really a teen teen period when she was during the Armenian genocide and she would discuss the harems and she would do, there was a huge emphasis on the Christianity aspect. Obviously Armenian as well, but it seemed to be very pointed that it was because they were Christians and a Christian population, whereas the young Turkish government at the time was Islamic. And that seemed to be a big reason why so many were killed. Um, and I wanted to ask you, is is the fact that, you know, the Armenian kind of religion at the time and even now is um, deeply religious in the sense of, um, you know, Christianity, or was it more because Armenians were Armenian and not Turkish that they were wiped out? Actually, actually, both of those arguments are valid, among others, to, to the extent that the Armenian population was Christian. And it needs to be kept in mind, even though they are living in the Ottoman Empire, the Armenian people were living in Armenia, in historic Armenia. They, had, they right. were a conquered people that had been incorporated into the Ottoman Empire, just as uh, Arab Parts of the world had been conquered by the Turks and parts of uh, Greece, Bulgaria, and Romania, Serbia, and many other parts of that uh, region of the world had been conquered and occupied. And so they were ruling uh, uh, upon these people. And then to uh, magnify the contrast between this ruling population and subjugated population was the religious difference. Uh, Armenians uh, pride the, in uh, invoking the fact that they are the oldest Christian nation, you know, having acknowledged Christianity officially in the start of the fourth century, 301, and adhere to that faith. And it, and it uh, has played a, uh, a central role in uh, the, uh, formation of their uh, culture and uh, and the flourishment of their arts. Uh, and Islam being the dominant faith, uh, subjugating these other these others, including uh, uh, people of the Jewish faith, uh, the Greek Orthodox faith and so forth, uh, then stood in contrast. And the point is not so much that there was this, dif this difference, and, and it was hierarchical. And uh, Christians and Jews might, would have been looked down upon uh, by the dominant Muslim population. It's, it's the way the uh, ruling elite and the government in particular, and in, in the case of the Armenian genocide, the, the one distinct group, is the manipulation of religion uh, to serve political ends. And so the uh, incitement uh, that tends to aggravate what may be differences into becoming, uh, 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 reaching a point of tension where conflict bre breaks out or where the persecution of one group by the other becomes tolerable uh, and legitimate, and uh, the end result is always some horrific event. Yeah. Uh, this has repeated in many places. The Jewish pogroms in Russia uh, uh, were repeated many times, and the mistreatment of the Armenians and massacres of Armenians in the Ottoman Empire had occurred many times earlier. And uh, so, so I'll add that third dimension, which is when a people is reduced to, to the status of a minority, 
Uh, they are also defenseless. Uh, the people that are associated with the state are typically armed uh, and are legally armed, whereas a subjugated population is disarmed. And so there is a disproportion of power between the two, where one is, in a, especially in a crisis, is particularly powerless in all the capacity you know, to exercise any kind of power is then reserved uh, for the people uh, that have the resources and the weaponry uh, to uh, utilize uh, against this other population. That needs to be kept in mind as well. And when minorities, as we've seen, uh, there are characteristically, ethnically, linguistically, and religiously different from majority populations in difficult economic situations or times of crisis or warfare can easily be scapegoated because it diverts the attention of the population from the larger problems and lets them vent uh, their uh, frustrations, as well as I say, the economic inducement that often comes with uh, the uh, um, the expulsion of uh, of a group and the resources that are left behind. Uh, this has been a subject that more and more is receiving attention uh, now in studying how and why the Armenian genocide occurred and who benefited uh, and how the beneficiaries uh, propelled. Uh, the uh, the violence and the atrocities uh, that's to be weighed as well. Yeah, no, that's that's a very good point. Um, to I remember in researching it, there was an emphasis on several different potentials for why the Armenian genocide happened. Um, I was, you know, I was also I believe in the research that I did. Also, it was uh, believed that you know, some Germans were actually there during the Armenian Genocide. And so it's thought that um, the Armenian Genocide may, may in some ways have inspired the Germans with the techniques they used in the Holocaust. Um, is that true? I think it's true. Uh, and I'm glad you open up that subject uh, for discussion. Uh, the... German presence uh, was even larger than the American presence in, in Ottoman Turkey during the time of the war because there were uh, two states in alliance. That's the same period, Germany and Ottoman Turkey. Uh, and there was a very large German military presence. Uh, in fact, the chief of staff was pretty much of, of the Ottoman military was being run by German military planners and uh, commanders in the field. Um, and there was also a, uh, there were substantial German economic interests as well as uh, a company building a, a rail line across Ottoman Turkey. So there were a range of people uh, of German background in Ottoman Turkey who also witnessed uh, what was happening to the Armenians. And so there's just like the American stream of evidence, there's an equally valuable and perhaps even more so valuable stream of German language evidence to the extent that German diplomatic uh, personnel witnessed and reported what was going on, business people witnessed and reported, military people um, you know, witnessed what was going on. Uh, but they were in a completely conflicted situation. On the one hand, they were quite horrified uh, by all of it, while at the same time, they are conducting war and with an ally, and so are compelled to restrain themselves from interfering in what would have been considered the internal affairs of a friendly ally. Yeah. And so there are two facets, unlike the American evidence, which is all condemnatory. Uh, there's not one American that said, well, we, you know, it's not our business. But there were Germans who, especially officials, who, who, who took that view and uh, attempted to restrain um, the efforts by uh, of Germans who were offended by what they were seeing in mm. trying to interfere and to see if they could prevent uh, or alleviate the uh, uh, the situation. 
it's sub it's substantial evidence and that too has been uh, uh, collected and uh, uh, available for research as well there's there's no shortage of documentary evidence on the Armenian genocide it's, it's just virtually the archive of every country in Europe uh, and in the region has been tapped and some of them have yielded uh, enormous quantities of uh, of material and evidence uh, all of it pretty much saying the same thing in, in their outline and even in the details but that's just not a way to know for sure now You're inspired yeah to to get to the other part of the uh, case that you made which is uh was there a connection to the holocaust which is the standard question and the answer is actually yes because a number of the officers who've been identified by name and by office who served in the uh, Ottoman Empire ended up joining the Nazi party hmm. and obtaining high office. And the most curious case is uh, that of the commandant of the Auschwitz camp which is which was the largest extermination camp uh, where the Jewish people were sent en masse to their death. Uh, one might argue that a certain level of desensitization began to implant itself among these individuals who witnessed these atrocities and uh, came to subscribe to Hitler's view that the rest of the world wouldn't care. Yeah. Uh, wouldn't pay attention uh, in seeing this kind of uh, mistreatment of civilians or the persecution of a minority. That's so interesting. Because um, to be honest, it, um, you know, I found I found that I don't know, I don't remember the historian that I was reading, but that was the first time I had heard something like that. Because you know, you learn about the Holocaust pretty early in education, I would say, at least I did. And uh, there was no connection or any sort of, like the Armenian genocide is, wasn't brought up um, as some sort of background that might be interesting to add in there. Um, you know, I but I, I wanted to ask you, you know, I know I want to be respectful of your time. Um, one last question, you know, from all of the evidence and the survivors and descendants of survivors that you have spoken to or read their testimonies is there one in particular that you think really stands out to you or one that you know you remember very vividly that kind of impressed itself on your memory that you could share there were many but you actually invoked one uh, who you with whom you've become familiar I met and interviewed Aurora Mardiganian, whose so cool. story has been told now in writing and in, in an animated film and in silent film at the time. Um, you saw uh, Aurora Sunrise? I, I yeah. knew and interviewed and recorded her story, and it is all preserved on tape. Uh, and uh, so she orally recounted and re-verified the account that was written down when she first arrived in the United States and did not have command of the English language. Uh, and uh, I can attest that uh, the oral version was even uh, more chilling uh, than the uh, uh, edited uh, written account uh, because it had to be uh, the published version the, the, had to be uh, tolerable to the breathing audience, uh, whereas what she went through uh, was even more uh, disturbing. Um, yet, uh, even in advanced age, uh, she was clear and lucid in recalling those many episodes in her life uh, that made her story uh, so compelling. And her arrival in the U.S played a very large role in helping raise funds uh, yeah. for a humanitarian effort.
the uh, campaign of feeding the starving Armenians. And uh, those funds went a long way in salvaging the survival population because at the end of the war, they had nowhere to go to. Uh, they were homeless, stateless, jobless, uh, surviving in the uh, wilds and in, in the desert if, that hung on, and no way to return to what had been their previous home. So the end of the war didn't mean the end of the horrors that they endured. And so the American humanitarian intervention played a very large role in saving thousands upon thousands of orphans from uh, veritable starvation. And there's a very dramatic imagery, photographs taken at the time where yeah. these uh, uh, individuals, uh, rescuers arrived and found the skeletal survivors and in due course uh, delivered sufficient food where you can see them return back to life. Uh, that intervention is another, uh, that humanitarian intervention is another episode of history, of American history that really should be uh, uh, talked about plenty more and what a difference it made. Well, I want I want to ask a follow up to that because I have been told because I read Aurora's book Ravished Armenia a couple times uh, throughout the course of the last I don't know 8 years or so and I was told that you know it's cuz interestingly even when you look at the document you know if anyone previously who has watched this you know aurora's sunrise which is a is sort of a docu-film about her story it doesn't mimic the book very much um and i've been told it's because the book was over sensationalized because there was an emphasis on the christianity and there was an emphasis on the victimhood of aurora as a woman specifically to kind of arouse the emotions of the american people to do something um, but it wasn't actually all accurate, and it was added to by the journalist to make it sound worse. So can you clarify that for me, you know, in your research? Is that true that the book is less trustworthy? Because I've been told that her oral testimony was actually different than the book, and they didn't quite match up. No, uh, quite the contrary. I, uh, my sense of the reading of the, uh, of reading the book is, as I said, uh, uh, mm -hmm. Well, you are right in the sense that uh, the editors uh, were trying to reach an audience. Yeah. And so the appeal to Christian sentiment, human sentiment, and of course uh, uh, the uh, mistreatment of women being an issue that perhaps would have had uh, more appeal for purposes of fundraising uh, makes complete sense. But to say that there was an overemphasis that changed the story uh, is 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 not correct. As I say, Aurora's account, uh, uh, personal account, was so dramatic and uh, so compelling that one telling isn't really sufficient. You can't put it all in one film. You can't put it all in one book. You can't put it all in one in one narrative. Uh, all of her uh, experiences uh, need to be uh, put together and all of her accounts uh, taken together to have a, a more complete picture, um, a more three-dimensional picture of who Aurora was and what happened to her and to keep in mind uh, what teenager who goes through the kinds of abuses that she went through comes out at the end of it with sufficient sanity to be able to speak up with courage and clarity uh, uh, about her experiences. Uh, yeah. She is a most extraordinary uh, human being. Yeah. Very, no, it's very true. Well, Dr. Dalian, you know, I thank you so much for your time and for listeners. You will see a link to the Armenian Institute. There's actually um, a couple kind of websites that are connected together, but this one will go directly to the Armenian National Institute, and there's a bunch of photographs and documents and um, history that you can read and view and do your own research on. Um, 
provided by Dr. Dowling and his team. But uh, Dr. Dowling, thank you so much for your time and for taking the time to share more about this. It's really appreciated. You're most welcome.